Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Population Data Science webinar series. Uh, today, we will be having a presentation entitled Sensing Pedestrian Flows for Real-Time Assessment of Non-Pharmaceutical Policy Interventions During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Mm -hmm. By way of introduction, our presenters include uh, Jonas Klingward. He is a methodologist at Statistics Netherlands in the Research and Development Department. He has a PhD in Research Methodology from the University of Dunedin. Essen in Germany. Jonas's work and research focuses on using technologies and data sources to improve data quality in official statistics. He has a broad expertise in the use of survey, sensor, administrative, and spatial data covering several contextual areas. His work has been published in the International Journal of Health Geographics, Survey Research Methods, Social Science Computer Review, International Journal of Population Data Science, Statistics and Operation Research, and Statistical Journal of the IAOS. Sven Alexander Brocker is a research associate and PhD candidate at the University of Duis Essen in Germany. Sven's current research focuses on health outcomes of children and adolescents in divorced and separated families. He has a background in survey methodology and is also interested in exploring novel data sources for data science application. Uh, and finally, Sophie Debro is the Scientific Coordinator and Strategy and External Positioning at Sciencesano. She has a visiting, she also has a visiting chair at the University of Maastricht in, in Smart Statistics for Policy Design. Between 2015 and 2021, Sophie was Head of Metho Methodology and Scientific Director of the Center for Big Data Statistics at Statistics Netherlands. Uh, CBDS was set up to innovate official statistics using big data sources and new methods in data science. She has a PhD in social statistics, reproductive health from the University of Southampton, UK. She previously taught at the Universities of Southampton and Duisburg, Essen, Germany, and worked at the official at the Office for National Statistics in Titchfield, UK, as a researcher. So welcome, uh, everyone, uh, to, our to our presentation today. Thank you so much to uh, Sophie, Sven, and Jonas for presenting. I really appreciate your time and uh, willingness to share your expertise with our network. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sven. Thank you, Anne. So hi, everyone. I'm Sven. And today we will present some of the results of our study, which we conducted last year. Um, as the title of our presentation says, we used sensor data measuring pedestrian flows to assess policy interventions during the COVID-19 pandemic, namely the so-called non-pharmaceutical policy interventions or NPIs, uh, which will we will come back to later. So, as you're probably aware, the development of real-time indicators is an active field of research not only in the social sciences, but also in the field of official statistics. And compared to surveys or administrative data, the main advantage of these measurements is their fast availability and accuracy of measurements as they come mostly from census, but also from social media or transaction data. And during the last two years, during the pandemic, official statistics and social sciences played a central role for policymakers to provide timely information which was and still is urgently needed to make fast and reasonable decisions. And at the heart of the discussion were often the measures which governments implemented to contain the spreading of COVID-19 before and still after a vaccine became available. And these are the so-called non-pharmaceutical policy interventions or NPIs in short, which are actions um, apart from taking medicines or getting vaccinated um, that people can take to slow the transmission of the virus. So, for example, if you're staying at home when you're sick, that would be an NPI, uh, but also on a larger scale, lockdowns um, or closing schools or universities and so on. So, governments all over the world implemented several of these NPIs with varying severity, depending on the country. And during this pandemic, we had maybe for the first time a large variety of technologies to analyze human behavior, but also the effectiveness of these policy measure, measures uh, during a crisis. And what mostly has been used uh, were survey data. So asking people about certain topics and their behavior um, 
as well as mobile phone data, which can be used to assess patterns and changes in behavior regarding mobility. And one thing that has received very little attention thus far um, in the scientific community and which is central to our discussion today are sensor-based location measurements, which can also be used to assess the effectiveness of the NPIs. And compared to survey and mobile phone data, we think those sensor measurements have a couple of advantages, which we'll present next. So first surveys or regarding the pandemic, more specifically web surveys, um, are conducted and used to measure the attitudes and the behaviors of populations regarding the MPIs. And most countries have implemented one or at least a couple of such surveys. Well, while web surveys, um, COVID-19, of course, is an infectious disease, so personal interviews were not really an option. Um, that makes web surveys the main alternatives. And those have a couple of advantages. They don't require interviews. They have relatively low costs and short field times. And of course, the data is available pretty fast. Um, but there are two problems that we face when using survey data in the context of the pandemic. First, um, there is social desirability, which means that the behavior that people report might not be true and the actual behavior might differ, especially when it comes to sensitive behavior regarding health-related topics. Next, we have recall bias. Um, depending on when you ask people, they might not be able to recall accurately what things they did in what way, um, not to give misleading information on purpose, but because they just don't remember correctly. And in contrast to the mentioned advantages, web surveys also suffer from two main disadvantages. Um, first, they are generally not based on random sampling and therefore do not allow inferences about the general population. Um, secondly, there are several studies which found that web surveys are especially biased when it comes to health-related variables, um, mostly because of selection processes. Next, we have mobile phone data, uh, which have been used to evaluate the behavior in real time. During the pandemic, many large companies um, also donated mobility data exactly for this purpose, for example, Facebook and Google Mobility. And the changes in mobility during the pandemic were mostly assessed by using such mobile phone data. But also, as with web surveys, there are a couple of problems with this approach. Um, the third point on this slide um, lists these preconditions. So, for example, the device must be owned if an app is used um, for tracking mobility. The app must be known um, if a person is using uh, or the person using the app shouldn't have privacy or security concerns, should be willing to participate and must enable the service, for example, GPS or Bluetooth as, if it is needed, and the device must be carried um, for the results to be accurate. And taken together, all these preconditions, it is very unlikely that these will result in a random sample, so specific subpopulations might be excluded, and the usefulness of such technologies um, for the measurements in the context of the pandemic is also still debated. Which brings us to the next point, location-based sensor measurements, um, which we used in our study. As already mentioned, these have been rarely used so far. We only know of one application at a German university, and these sensors measure pedestrian flows in different cities, which are in the case of Germany, which are rather large and they have a couple of advantages. So the first is that sensors measure actual behavior of individuals and thus bypass um, the mentioned problems in the context of surveys, namely social desirability and recall bias. Second, um, there is not the same kind of selectivity as compared to mobile phone data. So the measurement does not really depend on owning or using a certain technology. Third, um, the sensors do not measure who or which specific person visits the city center, but whether a place is visited at all. Um, so this technology does not suffer from the common problems and objections regarding data protection and privacy concerns. And fourth, um, as these sensors measure in real time and give um, passenger counts on an hourly basis, basis, it is possible to analyze the data almost in real time. The data we used in the study uh, were provided by a German company called highstreet.com, 
Um, they are based in Cologne in Germany and they began measuring with their sensor systems in the May of 2018 at 27 locations in Germany. And since then they expanded their network of sensors. Um, at the moment they are in 78 cities at 166 locations. Um, for example, also in the Netherlands, in Switzerland or Austria, um, and in the future probably other countries as well. And the positions of these sensors were chosen strategically based on economic considerations. Um, the main target group for the data are businesses or local businesses. So they are placed on highly frequented streets, that's the name. <laughs> um, and they are installed on building facades and um, project a laser beam from the building facade uh, down on the street. And the laser beam is invisible to the eye and also safe. Um, there's just one minor problem. There are, of course, measurement errors um, in the case of blockages. So, for example, if a tree is growing uh, straight into the laser beam or there's scaffolding in the way or when energy failures happen. On the next slide, we have a photo of such a sensor. So, you can see one. Um, under this metal shield. So the sensor is just this, this white box underneath here um, attached to the building facade on the left side and down on the street you can see some pedestrians uh, which are walking right, right through the laser curtain um, and as people are mostly not aware of being counted by these sensors we believe um, that the issue of people trying to manipulate the count by walking back and forth is negligible. So the period um, on which we focus in our study was the 1st of January 2019 to uh, well the mid of April 2021. We focused on 49 cities and 100 sensor locations and sensors with a downtime of at least three weeks in the time period being analyzed were excluded. So it's only those 49 cities, 45 of these cities were larger than or had more than 100,000 inhabitants and four cities had between 20,000 up to 100,000 inhabitants. We also looked at the patterns of pedestrians um, regarding on the cities, uh, depending on the city size and found no real differences between different city sizes. So we believe they are rather similar. Here you can see a map of Germany with the positions of the census. Um, the black dots on the map indicate where the city census are and the red circle around shows uh, how many census there are in each city. So the larger the red circle, the more census. And you can see here in the west of Germany, here's Dusseldorf and here's Cologne. Um, that's where High Street is located. And two federal states in the east of Germany, the gray shaded ones, don't have a census, so they are shaded out. Non-pharmaceutical policy interventions, which are already mentioned several times. Um, in the midst of March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic. And uh, up to April 2021, the German government tightened, extended or created um, measures, 15 um, in different points in time. And these measures were intended to reduce the number of social encounters as I said, and we tried to quantify the stringency of these measures. And there's this uh, project called um, the Oxford COVID-19 Government Response Tracker. Um, and they have developed uh, an index called the Stringency Index, which consists of nine indicators um, to measure the severity of the measures and consists of nine um, measures, mainly school closures, job closures, cancellation of public events, um, restrictions of meetings, public transport, order to stay at home, or as we call them, lockdowns, restriction of domestic movement, international travel controls, and also public information campaigns, and range from zero to 100. Zero meaning there are no measures um, at place. 100 would be the strictest. And um, this project collects systematically and consistently in the most countries of the world. So it's really a great data source to track how the stringency developed over time. And before we come to the results of our analysis, just a short summary of the interventions in Germany from March 2020 to April 21. Um, you can see the four columns. 
a number of measure, um, the date, the specific date when a measure was introduced, what kind of intervention was introduced and the according stringency index for this day. So for example, in the first row, uh, schools were closed until May, universities until summer 2021, and the stringency index for the 13th of March 2020 would be a 33. Um, around two weeks later, non-essential businesses have had been closed, so um, public gatherings were also restricted, so the stringency index rose to 77. Um, and changed then during the next month, in the winter of 2020, 2021, um, the stringency index was, well, largest point to, and was extended several times um, to April, which we measured. Okay, thanks, Sven. Um, I will now talk about the results of our study. So, um, on this slide, I will first introduce this figure a little bit uh, because of course it uh, contains quite some information. So on the Y scale, you see um, the pedestrian counts and on the X scale, our considered uh, time period reaching from January 2020 to the mid of April 2021. And uh, uh, you see data of the pedestrian counts in 49 German cities at 100 locations. So these gray lines, there are 100 gray lines. They show the uh, individual counts of each of these 100 sensors. And um, the line with the color gradient shows two things. First, the uh, daily average over these 100 locations. And second, um, the color gradient is determined by the stringency index. So um, if we have a low index value, this um, color gradient is uh, green. and turns um, into high uh, or into red when we have a high index value. Um, and as you can see in the beginning of uh, uh, January 2020 until March 2020, um, nearly no uh, strict measures were in place. And um, this, uh, as you can see, there's a dashed line. And this is the, uh, the, the exact date when the uh, WHO declared um, um, COVID a pandemic. And um, soon after that, uh, the German government started uh, reacting and put uh, non-pharmaceutical policy interventions into place. Um, but as you can see in the figure, actually before the, uh, the stringency index uh, starts um, uh, turning from green into light red, um, the pedestrians, so the, the population, so to say, uh, reacted before strict measures were um, enacted. And um, this, this uh, low phase between mid of March and mid of April 2020, that was a phase in Germany when there was a, um, a strict lockdown and um, only essential businesses uh, and shops remained open, but um, most of the uh, shops and businesses were uh, so everything is uh, non-essential was closed. Um, and what you also can see that in the phase of May 2020, although this uh, st uh, stringency index still remained high and although a lockdown was still in place, um, the numbers of pedestrians started to increase again. Um, so there were two things. Uh, the one is that the, um, uh, that the population uh, started decreasing their mobility before the uh, interactions and the policy interactions came into uh, place. But they also started to, uh, uh, or the mobility increased before policy interventions were relaxed. And then during the summer phase, um, the, the interventions were uh, relaxed a little compared to April and May. And in the phase of November and December 2020, there was a so-called light lockdown. And um, there, all shops remained open. And you, you don't actually see a change in, in that version of lockdown compared to this very hard lockdown in the beginning of the year. Um, and then when in December 2020, uh, all shops and um, most businesses had to close again, then the sensors detected immediately a drop um, 
in the pedestrian counts um, again. And these um, dotted lines, uh, if you um, compare that with the table before, they are enumerated in the same way as the policy interventions that were introduced by Sven. Um, on the next slide, we um, uh, expanded this figure a little. So, um, um, yeah, thanks. Um, um, to the end of 2021. And um, what we actually see here is that the stringency index, so the non pharmaceutical policy interventions, remained quite high during 2021. Um, but uh, the, the trend in the pedestrian counts as in 2020 with these extreme lockdowns, that's not visible anymore. And the reason for that is that besides these first two phases, um, there was never again the case that these non-essential businesses had to close. And since these sensors are located around these areas, we never saw or these sensors never detected these extreme drops in pedestrian counts um, again. And we marked two additional things, uh, which are the um, variants of the virus. The one is uh, Delta and the second is Omicron, because in 2021, uh, uh, the discussion about different variants of the virus became more prominent. And um, also Delta and Omicron were much more infectious than the variants we had before. But um, according to the measurement of the sensors, the population behavior was not, in, in terms of the pedestrian counts, um, was not really affected by the uh, fact that there are more, um, uh, variants, pre um, most prominent, which are much more uh, infectious than before. Um, and an, an additional analysis we did is on the next slide, um, where we compared the um, pre-pandemic year to the pandemic year. Uh, in terms of, we calculated the weekly relative differences between these two years. So the pre-pandemic year is uh, 2019 and the pandemic year is 2020. Um, we could do that for 20 German cities because for these cities, the um, time series were uh, uh, yeah, long enough for these two periods uh, to compute the relative difference. Um, and again, these gray lines show the individual sensors, and the red line shows the weekly daily, uh, the weekly average, and the uh, horizontal black line at the zero shows a relative difference of zero, so there would be no difference. And that means, in case the red line is below the zero, the uh, weekly uh, counts, um, the weekly pedestrian counts in the pandemic year were smaller compared to the pre-pandemic year. And with the exception of, 20, uh, of the first few weeks of 2021, you see that um, there's an, uh, all, um, the, the, the entire time period, the average is below this horizontal line, which means the entire pandemic year, um, that these places were less um, uh, visited compared to the pre-pandemic year. So these are, um, um, our main results uh, visualized. Um, and going to the next slide, um, we uh, want to discuss our um, findings a little. So the first point is that um, I also mentioned that while talking about the figures. So these reductions in pedestrian counts were recorded before policy measures were either introduced or tightened. And uh, conversely, an increase in pedestrian counts was, was measured before the interventions were relaxed. So these sensors detect changes in population behavior before interventions were um, either set into place or relaxed. Um, these less stringent measures, uh, so non-pharmaceutical measures, did not achieve a significant, a significant reduction in pedestrian um, frequencies compared to more stringent measures, so that these findings are consistent with the stringency index. And a reduction in pedestrian frequencies was always associated with an increase in stringency index. Although in the second figure I presented um, with the, uh, the development of the pandemic, and especially in 2021, 
this effect vanished a little. Um, could be argued that the population might be uh, get used to uh, the pandemic situation and uh, also does not yeah, react to, to the uh, pandemic as the population did in, for example, 2020. Um, and what we also found is that after the interventions in 2020, the pedestrian counts decreased, so compared to 2019, by a maximum of about 85%. Um, and these findings highlight on the one hand the potential and practical relevance of such uh, sensor data for measuring human behavior in real time. Um, and coming or continuing uh, uh, with the discussion is that until now, to best of our knowledge, such real time sensor systems that measure in situ um, have been really uh, rarely used in the pandemic situations to assess policy decisions and in our opinion that's a valuable additional data source for official statistics so for example in, in the meantime the uh, uh, german um, uh, office for uh, uh, national statistics also started using this source and publishes a weekly indicator using this data um, but um, um, what needs to be considered if you really want to use such data for official statistics should be thought about including these um, sensors within research design and also Sven has mentioned that before um, there needs to be quality assurance so um, there, um, we also saw that there are some sen sensors that had considerable downtimes and if you really want to use that in statistical productions you have to um, make sure that um, the quality um, is kind of stable all the time. Um, there's no techno uh, technological acceptance necessary with uh, such uh, systems. Um, and there's no selection bias as with, for example, variables or smartphones. Sven so explained that in the beginning. Um, and also note that there's no collection of individual data and accordingly, Using such data, um, there's no or data protection concerns play a minor role. Um, and we also think that there are versatile applications. So for example, you can use this data for um, to visualize dashboards, to track, for example, local anomalies. Um, there could be research questions for in, in, uh, in tourism or mobility statistics where such data could be used. Um, for data linkage applications, it, it's not possible to, to link such data on an individual level um, because um, um, yeah, it does not collect individual data. So you can link this kind of data via a timestamp or via a regional identifier to another given uh, or pre-existing data set. Um, um, and coming to, to the limitations of our study, so currently there is a selective placement of these sensors. So that means these uh, uh, locations where these sensors are installed were strategically chosen based on economic considerations. So close or next to highly frequented shopping areas. Um, as we also have seen in the beginning, the sensors are not available in every federal state, um, which is, but that's also. In, in the case of our selection cost due to the selection we've made. So um, if you would uh, select shorter time periods, um, there are sensors available in, in every federal state, um, but again, then only in selected cities. Um, the advantages of the anonymous data collection uh, limit the number of research questions that could be answered. So with such data, you cannot uh, answer any question uh, that addresses the demographic composition of um, uh, um, um, passers by. And um, you might also uh, miss certain parts of the population. So people that are non-mobile or inhabitants of rural areas or sick people um, will be missed. Um, and what we also so far um, did not account for in, in 
the description of the data we've made is that, that we did not account for, for, for example, for weather or seasonal aspects, um, vacation periods or public holidays. So that's, um, these points are definitely something for, for future research. Um, and to conclude, uh, the development of the pandemic situation has shown that measuring human behavior in real time is of high importance and um, um, such data will become more important for decision makers, not only at the national level, but also on the international level, if you want to act in a coordinated manner. Um, but what we also conclude is that um, overcoming the pandemic or that you can overcome the pandemic through human behavior and not only exclusively by using technologies. So the central point here is that human or social behavior, which is at the same time the most difficult to change, control and measure. Um, and our last point is that the relevance of such systems that measure societal changes in real time will increase as with a need for such information. So when you think about climate change or um, increasing water levels, especially um, such things um, need to be measured uh, by sensors. So the relevance will only increase. If you're interested in more details um, um, about the presentation, uh, you see on the, on the bottom slide, uh, the corresponding paper, um, it's open access and in the International Journal of Population Data Science. So if you want to read more about it, it's the way to go. And um, to finish this presentation, I um, um, uh, want to talk one minute about our current and future work. So based on pre uh, preliminary, uh, preliminary work that we've conducted, um, we have the following projects that are currently in progress. So um, first, we are currently working on developing a time series model using multiple data sources to um, build a prediction model for these pedestrian counts. And um, these multiple data sources we want to use contain, for example, city-specific information, economic information, mobile phone data, these non-pharmaceutical policy interventions. Um, so we kind of build a large or linked several data sources to build one big data set. Um, a second uh, project is that uh, the prediction of pedestrian volumes, um, um, or that we want to use a time series model to predict the pedestrian counts considering different policy interventions. So the idea is, for example, if you, if you don't use the stringency index of Germany, but for example, of a neighboring country in the EU, um, how would uh, the pedestrian counts change compared to using the um, stringency index for Germany? And the last project is that we're working on an, to develop an inference framework to predict pedestrian counts in cities without sensors. So that's tackling this selection problem of having sensors yeah, installed only in a subset of cities. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Sven and Jonas, for an excellent presentation and a very exciting work. And I, as you've mentioned, I think there's a huge uh, application that can be taken beyond uh, the COVID-19 situation to apply to many other situations specifically related to climate change, as you've mentioned. So thank you for sharing your work. Uh, just a, a question about compliance. Uh, one of your mm -hmm. slides mentioned that um, increased um, governmental uh, measures to mm -hmm. force compliance was not necessarily uh, reflective of a considerably higher compliance by by the populace. So one mm -hmm. might expect that you know more stringent measures would create higher compliance, but I think you mentioned that that, that wasn't necessarily the case, that the the change was relatively small. Yeah, that was uh, especially um, the case when uh, we had in Germany, it was always called light lock or lockdown light version. Um, uh, and in, in that case, yeah, the, the population was kind of told we have 
kind of locked down, but um, according to the sensors, you didn't see that uh, there was any change in, in the population at all. And uh, especially in, in the second figure where we expanded um, the, the time series, um, yeah, there you could see, I mean, all, all over the time, you have a kind of high stringency index, but um, the, the um, population behavior did not change anymore the further the pandemic uh, developed yeah mm -hmm. so maybe there are some policy implications um in terms yeah. of how how government should respond or react any any thoughts about that i mean we now looked only at these non-pharmaceutical interventions and um it might also be i mean this 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 uh, oxford project also provides other measures like pharmaceutical interventions. So um, um, yeah, future work could be done on if you if you see if you use other of the indices, whether they might um, um, better uh, or might might better explain changes or non changes in the counts. Yeah. Also, um, the longer the duration of the pandemic, um, the situation gets. Uh, kind of more complicated to analyze. We had uh, the vaccine as a game changer. So even if the pedestrian counts were the same at at another uh, point in time before, or, or would be even higher, at, uh, the vaccination might be a game changer. We also showed um, the dashed lines with the, with the different variants, um, like like Delta or Omicron. So um, it, it gets more complicated. Um, to entangle the, the influences of, of single single aspects. But in general, the longer the duration of the pandemic, um, the higher the city or the pedestrian counts in the cities again. Mm -hmm. So maybe people get, for lack of a better word, compliance fatigue. <laughs> Just, yeah. they're basically in saying, oh, we have to carry on, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that you're looking at um, an inference framework uh, for accounts um, where the sensor may not be, uh, you know, you may be putting into factors where the sensors cannot be uh, fully relied upon. Um, are you starting to do that work now or is that something in the future and how do you propose to address that? Um, yeah, the first step for that is that we kind of need to define a population, so um, to which we want to infer from from uh, these sensors. That means we have to, to kind of yeah define um, maybe using the number of inhabitants or something, so that we only consider the the um, cities in, in Germany above one thousand in, inhabitants or something, and um, then given this uh, data set that, that we've built, the, the idea would then be that given the observed part, we kind of would like then try to predict for unobserved cities how um, the pedestrian counts would most likely uh, look in those cities. Um, I mean, the evaluation of this framework then only could be done based on our observed data. So, um, that would give us an idea of how well our prediction model might work. Um, so we think that's yeah, kind of a, um, um, uh, yeah, how to say, yeah, a pilot study. And um, and in, in the nice case would be that if you have this inference framework and make predictions for a, a city where you don't observe data, and then you get a sensor in that city, and then you could actually start compare how well is our prediction model uh, uh, working? Are we completely off, or do we do we uh, uh, come up with uh, some reasonable predictions? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we, we've did that of using completely uh, different uh, sensors, um, and uh, uh, that uh, are traffic sensors. So there we developed such a framework. So the uh, ID would be kind of transferring that ID for these pedestrian, uh, pedestrian sensors. Yeah. Yeah. 
Very interesting. Yeah, that, that'll be a challenge, I'm sure, but an interesting yeah. one in terms of an yeah. outcome. Um, it will definitely be a challenge. <laughs> I don't, I don't see any questions, but I do wanted to ask you just in terms of anyone, mm -hmm. uh, other researchers who would like to do research comparable to yours, any best practice recommendations in terms of things that you had challenges with that you would do differently uh, if you had to start again? Any comments there? Um, yeah, one, one of the advantages that, that I always mentioned in when using sensor data is that you have that high accuracy, for example, compared to, to survey data. Um, but uh, in the beginning, it was kind of challenging. Yeah, you, you have to, uh, um, in these time series of all these sensors, you have to look for anomalies and for measurement errors. And because they, they are definitely present in the data, so sensors have malfunctions. And um, uh, that, that's definitely a challenge in the beginning to, to select uh, suitable sensors. I mean, in our case, it's still a reasonable amount of sensors, but if you go, yeah, if you have thousands of sensors, then this becomes even more challenging. Um, um, so that's that's something, uh, but, but I guess that holds for nearly every data set. That in the beginning, you have quite some, some work uh, getting an idea of, of what's actually in the data and what are reasonable measurements and what might be suspicious measurements yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. also communications um we had um some sensors which only showed a zero count for certain parts of the day and it's um well hard to believe that in in really large cities in the <laughs> in the um highly frequented streets even even at night no one not even one person uh would visit this street in an hour. Uh -huh. um, so we had, of course, talk to the to the data owners and um, find out what the zero is all about. Um, so it's also about um, uh, talking to the people who implemented the sensors and um, the systems itself. Yeah. So a big team of players that come together <laughs> to make yes. this work yeah. possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much for presenting uh, today. Really appreciate your time. And um, as always, this session will be recorded and we'll post to, to our website. Um, I look forward to hearing more from you as your work continues. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for, thanks for, for the invitation. Us. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you.